Okay, this talk is an AO, an academic orgasm. It's beautiful. I'm going to show you some cool stuff about how uh, people become demented. And by knowing about it, you can avoid this problem in yourself. So the title of the talk is Brain Inflammation, PS. PS stands for phosphatidylserine and dementia. And what I'm really showing you here is, you know, this idea of brain inflammation is becoming a bigger topic um, in understanding a neurodegeneration. And a lot has been written about the mechanism by which macro, microglia, they're the macrophages of the brain, are able to digest other cells or destroy brain cells, neurons. And I'm going to show you some stuff here. I think you're going to find this very interesting. First of all, here's a paper about the enzyme called flipase and phosphatidylserine. So phosphatidylserine is a phospholipid that's normally located on the inner leaf. By the way, I'm going to show you beautiful drawings of everything, but I'm just starting out showing you the papers so you'll know that these papers exist. So phosphatidylserine normally in a healthy cell sits on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, but when a cell is sick or there's something big going on, it'll flip to the outer leaflet. In a platelet, that can be just for platelet activation to initiate clotting. But in other cells, it's sort of a damage signal saying this cell is damaged and it's a signal to the local macrophages to eat the cell, to remove it from, uh, from, the, from the tissue. Okay, and these are the, the sort of the three big enzymes. There is the flipase, which flips uh, phosphatidylserine to the inner leaflet, the cytoplasmic leaflet, CL. OL means outer leaflet of plasma membrane. Um, there is the uh, flopase, less important for our purposes, but that'll flip, an, uh, flip a phospholipid to the uh, outer leaf bit intentionally, for example, like uh, phosphatidylcholine, uh, for example. Um, scramblase bidirectionally flips stuff. Now, these two are ATP dependent, flipase and flopase. Okay, that's an important point. They need ATP. They can only function in a healthy cell. These are the maintenance uh, phospholipid positioners. Okay, scramblaze is like an emergency. You know, scramble the uh, scramble the jets incoming. You know, over uh, over England. Okay, the all right. So let's see here. Okay, now you heard me talk in the past about phosphatidylserine on the external membrane. So here's phosphatidylserine externalization. Here's the phospholipid. There's a phosphate head which has a charge on it. It's polar, and then there's the um, fatty acid tails which are hydrophobic, that sit within the phospholipid bilayer. So the phospholipid, phosphatidylserine, will flip to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. So this is called phosphatidylserine externalization because the outer plasma membrane leaflet, you have an inner and an outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. So to go to the outer leaflet is a change in the structure of the plasma membrane. When with a red blood cell, that makes it stiffer, less deformable, less able to pass through capillaries. And that means that the red blood cell is getting older and it's going to be removed soon. Red blood cells only last 120 days and they're removed by the spleen. The reason is a red blood cell has a diameter of about 7 microns. Typically, typical capillary is about half that, about 5 microns. Uh, well, it's about 5 microns. And then in the spleen, though, there's uh, like capillaries that they have to pass through that are only about you know, filtration slits that are only about three microns in diameter. So if that red blood cell is stiff, it can't pass through those. It also becomes stiff because over time, as the red blood cell gets older, it becomes glycated. All right, so partially glycated. All right, so anyways, that's, that's how red blood cells are aged and are removed from the circulation. Okay, now a little bit about the plasma membrane that's rather interesting is if you take your, your certain charged phospholipids and you put more and more of them on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, that's going to do things. It could change the charge distribution across the membrane, creating a charge gradient. It can create uh, packing stress by the, the bigness of the size if you have more phospholipids on the inner than the outer leaflet. Um, you can send signals with this. When phosphatidylserine is in the outer leaflet, that's going to send some real important signals. It's like an eat me sign uh, sitting on the cell. So you don't want to normally do that. Okay, but the point I'm making is the incredible intelligence of the cell, that it, it sets up these intentional lipid gradients of charge and size and asymmetry that can be used to change the shape of the cell. Okay, and again, you need the ATP enzyme, flipase and flopase, to be pumping your phosphatidylserine to the inner membrane and your phosphatidylcholine to the outer membrane. Okay, so I just wanted to show you a couple articles about it. And all these drawings from these articles, they kind of stink, but I'm gonna, I made my own drawings that are much better than these. You're going to see them in just a moment. 
but I'm just giving you the background. So we talked about <clears throat> all these things and how they keep the cell alive. So the phospholipids are made in the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. They then have these lipid transport proteins that ship them out to the plasma membrane, out to the plasma membrane. And again, these little uh, sort of reddish circles are the uh, phosphatidylserine, and they should be on the inner leaflet, so on the cytoplasm side of the plasma membrane. You don't want them on the outer leaflet, and I'll explain why in just a moment. CL is also for inner leaflet, is cytoplasm side, cytoplasm leaflet. Okay, this is just some earlier things I alluded to that, you know, in a platelet, when it's ready to clot, calcium comes into the cell, that activates the platelet, and then it flips its phosphatidylserine into its outer leaflet, and then that can bind to uh, blood clotting proteins and initiate a blood clot formation, okay? In other cells, um, it's a bad thing when that phosphatidylserine flips to the outer leaflet. It's a signal, it's like wearing a big sign that says, eat me, okay? And we'll explain how that works here in just a moment. Okay, here's the first drawing. Here's my drawings, and these are gonna make a lot more sense to you. So here is the plasma membrane. Here is the cytoplasm of the individual cell. So that's the inside of the cell. So on this side is the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane, also called the cytoplasm leaflet of the plasma membrane. And there's two leaflets, an inner and an outer. Okay, so here is a normal flipase enzyme, which is ATP dependent. It's an important point. It's ATP dependent. You need ATP to do this. So the phosphatidylserine is always kept flipped to the inner leaflet. Same thing happens with phosphatidylethanolamine, but we're, we're only going to focus on phosphatidylserine. That's the only thing that matters for our purposes. Okay, so these little red circles mean phosphatidylserine is localized to the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. Simultaneously, to sort of keep things roughly symmetric, phosphatidylcholine, that's what the PC stands for, phosphatidylcholine is, is flipped by floppase to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane, and this also requires an ATP. So normal maintenance mode of a cell when it's healthy and happy is to keep its plasma membrane like this, with phosphatidylserines on the inner, phosphatidylcholines on the outer surface, okay? That means the cell is healthy. So if a macrophage comes by and puts its hand, its paw, on the cell, it'll go, oh, this is a healthy cell, everything is cool. All right, here's some things that can damage a cell. If there's a lack of ATP, like the mitochondria is dysfunctional because it's inhibited or it's damaged for some other reason, you're not gonna be able to maintain this asymmetry of the phosphatidylserine staying on the inner leaflet, okay? Other things can damage the cell. If the apoptosis pathway, programmed cell death pathway has been activated, that'll activate the enzyme caspase, and then caspase will deactivate these enzymes, okay? Big influx of calcium in a platelet will do it. Um, if there's damage to the neuron for other reasons, so we'll, we're gonna talk about some of those in a moment. Okay, now let's say that you know, for some reason the neuron's damaged, you can't make enough ATP, this enzyme scramblase can be activated and it does not require ATP. It makes sense that it wouldn't require ATP because if it did, you wouldn't be able to do it when ATP was deficient. So it doesn't require ATP and this can simultaneously flip things to the opposite of what they should be under normal conditions. It'll flip the phosphatidylserine to the outer leaflet and, and vice versa for the phosphatidylcholine. When this happens, phosphatidylserine's in the outer leaflet, you know, thus facing outward from the cell, complement proteins, these are circulating proteins, will bind to the phosphatidylserines, and they're just um, little hooks that help the microglia to get its big jaws on it. Microglia are these giant macrophage cells that can eat neurons. And under normal conditions, they do some useful things. You know, when the brain is developing, some neurons need to be removed. When there's synaptic change, uh, sometimes stuff needs to be removed, and microglia do their job, and they do a good, wonderful job under normal conditions. But you hear, here's what I'm saying is under some damage conditions, your neurons are being eaten up by your microglia, and you don't want that happening under normal conditions. I'm going to explain a little bit more about why that'll happen sometimes. Okay. Now, here's some things that can mess the situation up. If you have hypoxia, lack of oxygen delivery to the neuron, it can't make enough ATP. The mitochondria need, need oxygen to make ATP, and that's most of your ATP. If you don't have enough, and people get hypoxic all the time because at night they got obstructive sleep apnea. People um, have hypoglycemia, like diabetics give themselves too much diabetes medicine and they're hypoglycemic, and they have cognitive impairment from that, okay? Hypoperfusion is um, you know, lack of blood supply to the brain. We talked about that at great length. I made videos about Alzheimer's Turning Point. That was a book by Jack Delatore, and that's the Jack Delatore theory of sometimes called the vascular hypothesis uh, or vascular theory of dementia. And it's brilliant. It totally um, is it's the best theory for understanding macroscopic dementia. It's great. 
It, it totally fits everything I've seen in many thousands of cases of dementia that I've seen. Okay, you get atherosclerosis intracranial. That'll decrease oxygen delivery to the neuron, and that can eventually, over time, lead to not enough ATP being made. That neuron's going to die. If you inhibit the mitochondria, and there's tons of mitochondrial inhibitors in processed food. We've talked about these at great length. I have entire lectures on mitochondrial inhibitors. Things like Tylenol, statins, metformin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression, excessive fat, especially sat fat, mold inhibitors, which is the same thing as fungal inhibitors. Okay, um, if you have excessive stimulants overwhelming the cell and it can't keep up with that, that'll damage the cell. Um, CERC inhibitors, okay, the things we talked about a moment ago. All right, so then you'll, you'll get externalization of phosphatidylserine. It's called phosphatidylserine externalization. Complement binds. These are little hooks for the macro microglia to attach to, and it'll eat the cell, and the cell is dead and gone. And we're talking about your brain cells being removed, including when you don't want them to be. Now, there's some other mechanisms of it. You've probably all heard of beta amyloid. Beta amyloid protein is kind of like the boogeyman, the boogeyman of neurodegeneration. And you know what? Beta amyloid can cause problems. It's not the main obvious thing, but it is important and relevant. And so the, the macrophage uh, microglia, microglia is just a name for macrophages in the brain. They're, they're unique to the brain, the, the special type of macrophage called a microglia. Um, they're the, basically the security guards of the brain. And they walk around, they're always checking everything to make sure things are as they should be, copacetic, everything's cool. All right, so here's what can be a problem. When a person eats excessive dietary fat, that's the main cause of insulin resistance. When they get insulin resistance, the pancreas tries to compensate. So insulin resistance means that after eating a meal, the glucose can't get into the cells, like the skeletal muscle cells, for example. So the pancreas will make more insulin. It can double the amount of insulin you know, sent out into the blood, for example. Now you'll have elevated levels of insulin in the blood. Eventually, those ins that insulin needs to be removed from the blood, and it's removed by something called insulin-degrading enzyme, IDE. That's used to clear up the insulin. Now, IDE can only be made in relatively fixed quantities. It has a much higher affinity for insulin than it does for beta amyloid. But guess what? IDE, the insulin-degrading enzyme, is also needed to remove the beta amyloid protein. So... If the insulin-degrading enzyme is all used up because there's not enough of it by just removing the high levels of insulin, guess what? There's not enough insulin-degrading enzyme available to remove the BAP, the beta amyloid, beta amyloid protein. And it will then recross the blood-brain barrier, and it will enter the brain. And it can bind to microglia. When it binds to microglia, the microglia senses that as a problem, damage, you know, or a PAMPS, pathogen-associated molecular pattern. And the microglia can release toxic chemicals like hydrogen peroxide. It can also activate. It has other inflammatory chemicals. We'll talk about them in a sec. But it can release other inflammatory chemicals that will damage the neuron. And when they damage the adjacent neuron, because in a sense what the microglia is trying to do is it says, oh, could there be a bacterial pathogen here? Let me sterilize the area. So it will release all these powerful chemicals to sterilize the area. But those same sterilizing chemicals well, can destroy the neuron or damage the neuron. It externalizes phosphatidylserine, and the macro, and then the microglia goes, oh, damaged neuron, got to eat it. So this is how a normal neuron could be destroyed. So you don't want this going on. This is why another reason why diabetics are so stupid. They're destroying their neurons, their brain cells, not to mention all the other problems. I've given entire lectures on it. Does diabetes make you stupid? Okay, here's another paper. Primary phagocytosis of neurons by inflamed microglia. So that's the, the key phrase in this thing is microglia. So this is low-grade inflammation. When I say it's low-grade inflammation, what I mean by that is you can't see this on a brain MRI. If there is a frank bacterial infection of the brain and you have a, a bacterial abscess, pus in the brain, I can see that very easily on a brain MRI. It's a very characteristic appearance. There'll be a lot of edema. There'll be an enhancing wall. There'll be a central fluid collection that'll be you know, hyper-intense on diffusion-weighted imaging. There's a characteristic appearance for a brain abscess. But this low-grade inflammation, we can't see it. It's too subtle and small to be seen on a... Um, a brain MRI, but you can see it. If you know, if you put the patient's brain under microscopy, you can see it, uh, electron microscope or something. Okay. So, anyways, microglial phagocytosis of dead or dying neurons can be beneficial, um, but under certain conditions like inflammation, microglia can also phagocytize viable neurons, thus executing their death. Yeah. So what it's saying is, if you have a normal brain cell but there's inflammation, it could inappropriately, so to speak, activate the microglia, and it will eat your normal brain cells, and that can cause memory loss. It's bad. This is a very bad thing. 
So I want you to understand it, because when you understand it, you could avoid this. All right, for the most part. Um, so here's like a typical situation here. In this article, they're showing that LTA, that's the endotoxin from gram positive bacteria. LPS is the endotoxin from gram negative bacteria. Plus, we already just talked about beta amyloid. All of these things can cause activation of microglia. And when the microglia is activated, it can release hydrogen peroxide. It can also release, um, it can also activate something called INOS, inducible nitric oxide synthase. And it can make an excess of nitric oxide, the gas that can diffuse. It can combine with superoxide to make peroxynitrite. Um, it can cause problems. Inducible nitric oxide synthase with brain inflammation is different than endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So everybody's heard of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's what Caldwell Esselstyn talks about all the time. And that's a good thing to open up the arteries in the periphery of your body. Periphery means anything outside of the central nervous system. Periphery means your entire body other than your brain and your spinal cord. Okay. So Inos is bad because endothelial nitric oxide synthase is only brief, briefly turned on and off. Versus Inos, it can stay on for hours. It can produce tons and tons of nitric oxide, and it'll start interact, reacting with things that cause major problems. The peroxynitrite is O N O, you know, O N O O. So this is jokingly called the O N O pathway. Okay, uh, Martin Paul did a lot of good work on this pathway as well, and he calls it the O N O pathway. All right, so what this will have do then, once the peroxynitrite is released, it will damage the neuron, cause phosphatidylserine externalization, and then the neuron will be eaten. So this is a healthy, normal neuron that just got eaten because of the presence of all this inflammation. And when there's leaky gut, there's often leaky blood and beer. I'll show you a better picture in a moment. You'll see it will make more sense once you see my picture. Okay, so here is leaky gut. And when you got leaky gut barrier, you'll often simultaneously have a leaky blood brain barrier, leaky BBB. So here's normal endothelial cells with a tight junction between them. You lose a tight junction. And here's normal tight junction between gut lining cells, tight junction, gut lining cells. But if you have a gap in that tight junction, the bacteria can spill in from the gut, get across this single cell layer, and get into the submucosal tissue, then get into the blood. So you can get bacteria in the blood, but more importantly, more typically, you'll get LPS lipopolysaccharide and lipotychoic acid, the bacterial toxins, bacterial endotoxins they're called. They get into the blood. And then if the blood-brain barrier is open, as it often is when there's leaky gut, there can be a leaky blood-brain barrier. Some of this can get into the brain. LPS and LTA can bind to the microglia and they activate it. And then that'll activate microglia. There's an increase in the inos, inducible nitric oxide synthase. You make lots of nitric oxide, can combine with uh, superoxide, free radical, and make uh, peroxynitrite, and that can cause a whole bunch of damaging reactions and really damage the cell and, and kill it, okay? Um, again, when the microglia is activated, it instinctively just tries to sterilize the area by releasing toxic chemicals, but you don't want that because it can damage normal neurons. So the best thing to do is just prevent the leaky gut. When you prevent the leaky gut, you'll typically prevent the blood-brain blood barrier being leaky, and you'll avoid all these problems because this will damage the neuron, cause phosphatidylserine externalization, then the microglia will eat the neuron, including eat the, the good neuron, and that memory will be lost. So that's how it works. So anyways, I thought that was quite interesting. I thought that was rather beautiful and elegant. And the good news is you can avoid it. Avoid insulin resistance. Don't eat high-fat diet, okay? Avoid mitochondria inhibitors. I gave entire lectures on that. So anyways, I hope that was helpful.